Hello, and welcome to Composite Bodies and Interdisciplinary and Interinstitutional Collaboration that addresses questions of surveillance, technology, embodiment, and power from an intersectional feminist lens. I'm Caroline Light. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Studies in Harvard's Program in Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. And beha on behalf of my seminar co-convener, Patricia Williams of Northeastern University, I wanna start by expressing our deepest gratitude for the generous support of our three co-sponsoring institutions, the Northeastern University Humanity Center, the Harvard Mahindra Humanity Center, and Harvard's Program in Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. We also want to extend a very special thanks to Mary McKinnon and Daria Lugina for their indispensable administrative support for this event, and also to Gabby Fiorenza and Stephen Beal for their ongoing guidance and support throughout this year-long series. Finally, I want to thank all of you for joining us here for this second Composite Bodies seminar. Um, at any time during the event, we welcome you to submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And in the interest of time, we ask that you please try to keep your questions brief and to the point, and we will do our very best to get to as many questions as we can in the course of this hour-long seminar. Um, and now it gives me tremendous pleasure to turn things over to Professor Patricia Williams. Thank you so much, Caroline, and thank you, Max, for being here. Uh, and thanks to all who have supported and made this uh, presentation possible. Um, it is my tremendous pleasure to introduce my friend, Max Houghton. She is course leader for the photojournalism and documentary photography program at London College of Communication. Max is a writer, editor, and curator working with the photographic image as it intersects with politics, law, and human rights. She is a prolific writer who has published with Photographer's Gallery, Barbican, International Arts Press, including Foam, 1000 Words, Photoworks, and Granta. She's co-author with Fiona Rogers of Firecrackers, Female Photographers Now. Her latest monograph essay is on the American photojournalist, Mary Ellen Mark, and that will be published by Steidel in 2021. And her interdisciplinary research at University College London focuses on law and the image, which course of inquiry is actually how I met her. I was teaching a class in Paris some years ago entitled Seeing and Surveillance, and Max was such an amazingly astute contributor, participant, and since then, friend. In collaboration with performance artist David Birkin, Max is also co-founder of the Just Plain Fabulous research hub, Visible Justice. You can look that up at www.visiblejustice.org and it's absolutely worth a um, casting your eyes upon. Visible Justice is a transdisciplinary research platform for photographers, journalists, artists, activists, human rights lawyers working at the intersection of visual culture and social justice. Its concern is particularly with the victims of war and those living at society's margins. Her latest curatorial project will be a multidisciplinary exhibition organized variously in the UK, Ukraine, and Poland entitled What's Next? It is inspired by the Polish science, Polish science fiction author Stanislaw Lem and his notion of the Futurological Congress, which asks what is next for humanity? What can optical phenomena tell us about our place in the world or our very displacement? Can the representative regime of the image only reflect or can we turn to nature for new forms of seeing through diffraction and limitlessness? This curatorial project follows many of Max's, uh, the, the, the themes with which he is um, ordinarily uh, dedicated, including the ethical, technological, pharmacological, 
and ecological lines of inquiry, interrogating the inventions we have unleashed and which have changed us fundamentally. And the hope is to discover reparative modes of being and of seeing together. So this sort of inquiry is at the heart of all of Max's, in, Max's work. And I'm delighted to point out that she and I are collaborating on a series of encounters between Northeastern's campus at University College London, as well as here in Boston. We hope to engage students from both venues in exchanges about justice and the ethics of representation in both image and text. Again, thank you, Max, for coming and take it away. Hello, good evening. Thank oh, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Pat, for such a generous introduction and to, uh, to Pat and Caroline very much indeed and the Mahindra Center for this invitation. It's an absolute honor to be here. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I hope and trust that you can all see that. I think someone will tell me if you can't. Um, so I hope I can talk to you for the next 25 minutes or so about some of my present and abiding concerns, many of which Pat mentioned in her intro. Um, so yeah, as a writer and curator and educator within the broad or expanded field of, of the documentary photographic image, I chose the title with the word vigilare at the etym etymological heart of surveillance with that in mind and drawing out this idea of keeping watch or of being vigilant, of, of taking care, which I hope that that idea will remain implicated or folded into what follows. And Visible Justice, as, as Pat also said, is the name of the research hub I co-run with David Birkin at University of the Arts London. And our focus on is an interdisciplinary practice um, and the efficacy of the image in, in moving towards social change is something that I hope will arise in this talk today. Um, and further, the idea of the active image is one which I hope might become manifest as the slideshow plays. And it's because of uh, photography's own histories as a tool of classification and control that my work is therefore to make visible these sort of force fields, these racist and colonial force fields that surrounded and gave birth to photography itself and to notice the ways in which they prevail, many of which have been brought into um, very sharp focus by the current pandemic. Uh, and as we know, the, the role of the image in uh, determining our personhood has a long and violent history and technologies of surveillance have shaped who is seen and, and how and, and by whom. And it's led to certain bodies being broken and brutalized and ignored or rendered invisible. And these appearances and disappearances of female bodies, of black and brown bodies, of queer bodies, of all bodies considered secondary are the theme of this talk. Um, in an essay on machine vision, and um, it was about the works of Trevor Paglin actually and, and Heron Faraki, and how the military or colonial gaze can be apprehended and confronted. The writer Hal Foster um, posed a thought that has struck me as a way to, to really structure um, th this talk with you. Um, and it's this, that this new robo eye of machine vision does not extend the human prosthetically so much as it replaces the human robotically. <clears throat> so we'll work with that through the talk. Um, this might offer a way perhaps to be especially vigilant around matters of surveillance, um, all, all the while while tech firms are promising faithfully to do our seeing for us. Um, it was a kind of unseeing or sleepwalking that led Europe down the road to genocidal slaughter in the 1930s onwards. And as Hannah Arendt described in her last work, Life of the Mind, a life without thinking is quite possible. It then fails to develop its own essence. It's merely meaningless. It's not fully alive. Unthinking men are like sleepwalkers. Certainly Yinka Shonabari, um, taking on Goya's famous etching series, The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters, intends his audience to be as vigilant as the links that you can see in this image. It's one of a series of five images, uh, one for each continent, and Africa is the one on your screen here. With his very careful, careful staging and use of amazing taxidermy here, this British Nigerian artist intends to complicate questions of enlightenment thinking and what has gone on to justify in that very moment when the world emerged from darkness into light. And this particular kind of visibility has been used to justify many civilizing 
actions in places where the culture is neither understood nor considered in, in the first place. And it's the Enlightenment's commitment to this kind of empiricist knowledge and this scientific method that's shaped our world. And I want to question that idea of visibility um, equaling necessarily good and honest and true and right. We need to question even that and complicate that as Shana Bari does so very beautifully here. And it's because of photography specifically, its relationships with these scientific methods of sorting and controlling that I've become interested in how these practices continue to be carried out by newer technologies. For example, the employment of photography in the People of India, which was a sort of photographic encyclopedia of characteristic specimens, um, which was commissioned by the British Raj government. It was actually a pet project of um, Lord Canning, who really wanted a, a kind of photo album to take home, apparently, but obviously it also had another function in that it created a systemized approach to to understanding the sort of supposed traits of castes with this scientific precision it was published in um, 1868 in eight volumes i actually saw an original copy at the at birmingham library <clears throat> several years ago which was an extraordinary thing to to see and that in 1868 was just um doing the maths four years before the first census in british raj india in 1871 um, i've got a couple more slides from <clears throat> that publication you can see that it says <clears throat> the warlike frontier tribe <clears throat> etc low caste hindu these kind of judgments were made about particular types of people Um, photography had a very significant role too in the case of the communards in the same year 1871 in France when photography was used to both document revolution and it was also harnessed by the state for repressive purposes that is for future judicial identification identification and for the the 72 day uprising 40,000 names ended up in police files 10,000 people were sentenced to death um, or deportation or prison and as many as 10,000 people were killed um, I feel like this very image, um, you know, with its statue of Napoleon fallen over, it takes us in a couple of directions to very present concerns of street protest um, and to, stat to more statues that celebrate uh, war and subjugation. And it also takes us to visual strategies that are being employed to safeguard people on the streets, um, in particular in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement, obviously protesting about the relentless racist killings by police. Um, and yeah, this strategy has been um, suggested, has, is being used uh, by media organisations, um, this blurring technique, and it's, it's provoking a lot of debate specifically within the field of photojournalism and documentary photography. And this is actually an image by an extremely experienced um, practitioner, documentary photographer, and I think also professor in the States, Nina Berman. Uh, this is one of her images that's been blurred um, in this way. Um, but she is is not um, a, a fan. Sorry, that sounds simplistic. But she she doesn't advocate uh, this use of of technology to blur an image because it goes against all journalistic ethics of who and and when and where and why, um, especially the who, obviously. Um, and also, I read that uh, a report by a Times, as in New York Times, picture editor Brent Lewis who um, from a different perspective says it's wrong not to show the black struggle, it's wrong to make people faceless. It was interesting how quickly technology stepped up to this idea, just there's a whole raft of apps now that can do this work for the photographers or, or the editors, should you so wish. So yeah, just a thought about that. So obviously the desire to potentially stop people being subjected to any further violence is extremely powerful, extremely important. But on the flip side, what does it mean if specifically black faces and black names are erased or made strange? Um, removing faces removes the possibility of an ethical encounter with a human face that's sometimes thought of as the very foundation of ethics, certainly in the conceptualization offered by Emmanuel Levinas. But on the flip side, hypervisibility, which can be what a camera brings, shining a really bright light onto people um, who are in the streets in the first place because they're mourning, because they've been um, subjected to extreme and horribly violent um, practices for centuries. But that, that light might frame these same people as criminals within the kind of prototypical whiteness to, uh, to which Simone Brown in her amazing book, Dark Matters, um, refers. 
And the way in which she, Simone Brown, threads back this um, genealogy of racist lighting practices when blackness enters the frame, quoting her, to uh, 18th century lantern laws, that I thought might offer a methodology through which we can think through the most effective and safest and yet still active ways to use the image. Um, violence can be enacted in other ways by the image too, in the form of racist slogans and flags during protest. This is a project by the artist duo McDonald Strand, that's Claire Strand and Gordon McDonald, um, who are making an intervention into this violent spectacle in their collaborative project, which is called No More Flags, to which anyone can participate if they have images in which they'd like to have the flags whited out, then you can send them to nomoreflags.org. Um, and so when you um, see the, the resulting images, what's left um, is some angry white people. Um, but crucially, what's, what, what's their, their presence in the street is, is still there, but it's no longer visibly connected with some idea of nationhood or citizenship or a politics of exclusion. And the image I'm going to show you next came up during some research for this talk and apparently it's been credited as picture of the century and it's gone viral in different decades, but it's completely eluded my eye. So in the picture, um, a woman strikes a neo-Nazi marching in support of the Nordic realm in well, Reich in 1985. It's one of those genius decisive moment images, but as you will have noticed, this isn't um, a mistake. It doesn't in fact appear here. As I said, I happened upon it by complete chance, um, but I returned to it to see what I could find out about it. And though I haven't been able to completely triangulate what I've read, I think that I, this is verifiable that the woman who is strike this small middle age, she's called old, but she's actually apparently 35, I think, um, but she's striking this very tall skinhead with a handbag. And it, yes, yeah, this extraordinary image, but it turns out that she was the Polish Jewish daughter of Holocaust survivors. And that actually she was horrified by her public persona depicted in the photograph. And she was someone who already suffered from acute anxiety and mental health issues. And it's, it's thought that the mass distribution of this picture presenting her in a particular way was, and this is horrible, a contributory factor to her suicide two years after the image was taken. And that's why I haven't chosen to um, show it to you here. And the other horrific detail from the image is that the skinhead in the image marching for the Nordic Reich was later convicted for the torture and murder of a gay Jewish person. Um, such is the extraordinary and unexpected potency of an image to travel so far and to touch so many lives. And interestingly, um, a sculptor made a statue of this woman who I'm also choosing not to name, um, although obviously you can find out. Um, but the Swedish town where the incident happened rejected the statue for its violence. When people put their heads up against, uh, up above the proverbial parapet, it can be mortal danger that's at stake, with the degree of danger obviously having a precise correlation to the person's allocated position in racist and unequal societies. Uh, in China's Shenzhen province, to make a geographical but not contextual leap, we know from testimony that Uyghur women are being sterilized during operations for abortion or miscarriage. So how is it that Uyghur women are being identified in the first place? It's not by a protest in China. Um, although, as this image shows, sorry about the Reuters, I couldn't find a, another image, um, but obviously it was taken by a Reuters photographer. Um, but we, yeah, they are protesting in Turkey outside the, the Chinese consulate, but not, not in China. That would be way too dangerous. But just as IBM leased its Hollerith punch card and sorting system, um, the precursor to the computer, to the Third Reich, um, and as um, Edwin Black's investigation proved, uh, precise quantitative data collection operations were established in the concentration camps. IBM also organized the first census, that word again, for the Third Reich. So I've been wondering which companies are the IBM of today. I, I haven't sort of put that into to my research here. I'm not re you know, really the person to be researching tech companies in any particularly authoritative way, but it's certainly very interesting to, to notice you know, what companies are doing in one place and then what they're doing somewhere else. 
Um, but obviously there are companies facilitating this counting and classifying of Uyghur Muslims. Um, IBM, I'm not um, saying I'm, I'm not aware of IBM working in this specific area with China. I think certainly some Chinese uh, companies are, but IBM certainly does offer such a tool. It's called IBM Intelligent Video Analytics, and it's a software that's specifically designed to sort people into groups based on their facial and bodily attributes. Um, and the language they use on their very helpful web page describes the use of the technology on the captured person, which was obviously quite telling. Um, as we know from, I think a lot of the audience will know this fascinating work done by Joy Bolomwini at MIT, such technologies can conversely have, a trouble, have, have trouble detecting blackness when uh, it enters the frame. In fact, one of my students had asked why a black person would want to be recognized by AI, which is actually a much more complicated person than it might first appear. But this idea of uh, needing to be seen and heard has its own politics as women in a direct lineage through from um, Bolamwini through uh, Nona Faustine, this amazing series outside Sojourner Truth's home there on I a woman. Joy Bolamwini asked AI, ain't I a woman? And there is Sojourner Truth asking the same question. Um, considering the Chinese government's use of advanced facial recognition technologies for specifically racial profiling, it's no wonder that the young woman in, in the image in Turkey is masked, yet Bolamwini had to wear a white mask in order to be seen. Uh, in regions of China, facial recognition technologies are, they're actually integrated into surveillance cameras and there, there was a specific requirement from law enforcement officials um, for software that can characterize and search whether someone is a Uyghur or not. So one of the tags for the code was you can have kind of, you know, rec glasses, rec sunglasses, was rec Uyghur because it's part of the population that has different facial characteristics from the majority Han Chinese population. And as we know, the re-education camps in Xinjiang, um, they're well documented. And the genocide, genocidal violence against women is proven as their bodies are systematically taken to pieces. Given the use of human technologies, I'm sorry, given the human use of technologies for ill, it's not a surprise that when the UK announced that the tech company was that it chose for its partner for the NHS in relation to pandemic data tracing apps was Palantir, alarm bells rang. And just these two facts put together. So Palantir's um, Falcon software was used in the immigration customs enforcement raids in Mississippi, along with many other such raids. That fact, plus we know that people of colour are more likely to succumb to COVID-19 due to intersectional issues such as poverty and existing health. So that fit doesn't sound good. Um, while piecing together these ideas around surveillance and visibility over the last few months, there was um, one image that occurred on more than one site that I visited, and it seemed to be almost ubiquitous in, in how its futuristic aesthetic could be appropriated in any which way, but more than that, and to take us back before the second part of my presentation, to take us back to Hal Foster's phrase, this looks like a robotic replacement of the human. Um, I, yeah, I couldn't even find its origins. It's possibly from the film, the 2016 film Cyborg. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, but it just appears if you just put that into reverse Google image search, it's almost like our world is populated by this shattered androgynous creature. It's not an especially human um, image, but it seems to imagine a future which has already arrived and its robotic eye is keeping watch. Um, for the second half of this presentation, um, I want to look at the ways in which the human gaze is extended, perhaps into its optical unconscious, um, to use that uh, evocative phrase coined by Walter Benjamin, uh, by a variety of what I might call reversals or challenges to modes of surveillance. And there is not necessarily different kinds of surveillance, whether they're military or colonial or political or social. And so I want today to look at a few aesthetic strategies that are at work. For example, when uh, some female artists focus their assiduous attention on the placement of their own bodies within these complexes of visuality. And I'll also focus on an instance in which the creation of a language for a disappearance itself is explored, creating an actual language for this disappearance. Um, if the drone stands as one of the ultimate forms of contemporary terrorizing surveillance technology, um, that's where I want to bring in the work of Lisa Barnard with the non-logistical mother. What an amazing title that is. And the drone, drone technology has been the subject of mu much critique, including within documentary photography. 
Um, Lisa Barnard is an artist whose research integrity leads to vast explorations of seemingly impenetrable subjects and the drone program itself, also how gold, actual gold functions in the world. Um, she worked with the, the human rights NGO Reprieve, who We Visible Justice also work with, with Maya Foa uh, as its director and their creative campaigns. But Lisa um, accompanied Reprieve on a campaigning trip to Waziristan in protest at the CIA secret drone program. Um, Barnard's uh, photographic and filmic responses were multifaceted, but uh, actually a later work, she sort of revisited her own work and made um, this video essay, a much longer video essay than the, the one minute clip that I'm going to show you now. The thought of Elaine Scarry has been productive for me to apprehend the ways in which acts of violence can be inscribed into bodies, and I'm speaking of women's bodies in particular here. Um, while Scarry is theorising torture and, and war with a capital W, which is what we're looking at here, um, the pain of which she speaks has been inflicted to in, in well, from the plantation all the way through to the, the home, you know, the domestic violence that's being perpetuated during during the pandemic and um, she describes it Scarry describes it as the intense pain that destroys a, a person's self and world a destruction experienced spatially as either the contraction of the universe down to the immediate vicinity of the body or as the body swelling to fill the entire universe and I see those experiences at the level of form in this film um, Lisa was meticulous in telling me the precise details not only about the, the music from Tristan and Isolde but of, of this precise drone strike she's not just appropriating footage that she doesn't know anything about she knows all about it and like I say this is a at least a 25 minute um, video essay but yeah the, the sound of the hovering drone the expected death of your child as which was the daily experience for Waziri mothers as well as Lisa's own right, I think, to, to intervene as a woman into this masculine, I see it as a masculine playground of the arms fair that she was at. Um, I think she's following a tradition which she actually acknowledges at the beginning of this video essay, but a tradition perhaps began by Virginia Woolf with her amazingly provocative essay, Three Guineas. And I think Barnard is at once sort of ridiculing this industry whose trade is death and at the same time offering this new audience us her own body captured itself by a surveillance camera as she creates this subverse, subversive performance and running through this arms fair and this non-logistical mother who might be Barnard herself um, she basically photo bombs this machine at gaze with this very human movement cutting through this domain of militarism and capitalism I feel like her performance opens up the field of representation that's rendered women and women suffering invisible by a focus on the lethal machines. One of the videos we've worked with in, um, sorry, one of the artists we have worked with in our Visible Justice programme um, is Polymy Basu. She lives in the UK now. Um, but she's from Calcutta and has been an outspoken critic actually of domestic violence within the family home there. And so it makes sense that when she learned about exclusory menstruation practices in neighboring Nepal, that she wanted to find ways to work with young women and girls whose lives um, were en endangered because of, um, it's called Chapaudi, um, monthly banishment when they're menstruating into remote fields to kind of shed on stilts in remote fields. 
this very brutal form of bodily surveillance was an embedded cultural practice in the region. And over a several year period, um, Basu met with the young women on multiple occasions, and she devised the strategy using virtual reality technology to bring this vivid sense of banishment and um, estrangement and isolation to an audience who um, could perhaps otherwise ignore this strange and foreign practice. I'm gonna again show you a clip. I, I mean, not, it's not, this is a nearly three minute clip of a film. The, the work is a VR work. So in no sense, do you actually get a sense of it, but I wanted to bring it to your attention. Best, best we can. Sorry, just trying to make sure it doesn't play again. Um, yeah, with the West, the idea of the Western audience was actually in, in some ways an afterthought because this, along with journalists and activists, this work was aimed very much at Nepalese lawmakers. And it was this combined work, um, Basu describes herself as an activist, that did actually change the law. The practice of Chapaudi is now outlawed in that region of Nepal and girls who were banished and frightened who Polymies worked with for five years, they were, you know, banished, frightened, and perhaps most of all ashamed. When they were 16, they're now activists themselves on a public stage talking about this, well, talking about the, the issue through through this work and watching themselves, you know, with the VR headsets on, and that's on this with this website as well. Um, I'm going to turn now to the, the layered work of photographic artist uh, Sim Chi Yin. Uh, her research practices have opened up the personal story of her leftist grandfather, um, who was an opposer of the colonial regime. He was deported to China during the so-called Malay Emergency. This was British colonial rule. Um, the Malay Emergency in 1948 to 1960. He was killed in 1949 and his, um, his, his death was never discussed within the family. Um, 
it was also not very much discussed in um, in history, uh, this particular colonial history, and it was full of summary execution, forced mass resettlements and detentions, as well as the imposing of um, some emergency regulations, which apparently are still some of which are still in place in, in the region. So Sim went on this extraordinary journey through um, through Asia, meeting friends and relatives of her grandfather, you know, political activists of, of that era for, um, who, who did survive, photographing them and also objects that connected them to their pasts and, and landscapes that have witnessed more than any survivors. That was her take on it, these very atmospheric landscape images that she created. But perhaps even more than the, the sum of these works, these are just a couple of the archival um, images, that's the the, the last image um, known of her grandfather there, um, but was actually the way in which um, she has chosen to present it. So this um, chosen form of the performative lecture, which has just been so um, affecting. And there she is. I don't think she um, made this performance at a visible justice event. I don't think this is a still from there. But it's, um, yeah, it's really extraordinary the way she builds this very complex narrative, um, partly about whether or not communists, because um, that is what we're talking about, were considered freedom fighters or guerrillas. It was not discussed within in the family, within the culture, even after the brutal murder of one of them. And in this way, um, this performative way, the body of the artist becomes like a palimpsest whose layers are perhaps revealed by the combination of her voice and this almost spectral imagery um, overhead that, that flickers and changes. It's almost like she's channeling the spirit of her grandfather in this very rare kind of public performance. It's it's palpable um, that she's putting her own body forward, that she's honoring this man um, who, whose own resistance to colonial subjugation had become invisible and had been forgotten. The final body of work I want to talk about is the extraordinarily subtle work of Sophia Kareem. Um, and although what I'm going to show you here is image based, um, Kareem is an architect by discipline. I encountered her when her uncle, the very highly respected Bangladeshi photojournalist Shahid Al Alam, was imprisoned for making false and provocative statements on Al, Al Jazeera TV in the midst of anti-government student protests. Um, we were able to exhibit his work in a pop-up visible justice exhibition as part of um, a global justice campaign. And, and Kareem, his niece, came to speak. But there was something about her. She was speaking on behalf of her grandfather. I just knew she had a practice um, and I don't know anything about architecture, but she has a practice um, and it's very, very complex and very, very layered. But but to try to convey it, she's been pushing her architectural practice to try to find a language for disappearance and, and indeed for freedom. And these images that I'm going to show you are from an ongoing series called Lita's House. Um, and this one is Lita's House, The Great Bear. And this is based on um, a constellation that Shahid Lalam used to watch from his cell. And the dimensions that you can see in the drawing is also a reference to the space each prisoner gets in the holding cell at the jail, where they have to lie spine to spine. And if they can't afford to, to pay a fee, it's worse. And they have to lie, to, to quote Karim, groin to groin in scissor formation. And this is one of the architectural models she made to kind of help her think through this idea. These are tiny little bodies lying groin to groin in scissor formation. Um, this image, uh, Lita's house, when is the new year? sorry, When is New Year, um, is based on the poems of another incarcerated intellectual, Professor Sababa, Saibaba. Um, this gentleman is 90% disabled. He's on a life sentence in India. He's been on hunger strike. And uh, Karim regularly posts on social media about his incarceration. She's the most extraordinary activist. And she organized a huge uh, turbine bug at Tate Modern earlier this year, which was an anti-fascist anti protest led mostly by Muslim women. And then this is actually what, oh, I'll just show you a couple more images from Lita's house, but um, it was actually, yeah, I find it almost inexplicably moving. Um, it was actually this image that prompted me to contact um, Sophia for, for this, this presentation. It's just on her Instagram. It's called Ping 2020. And I just felt very moved by its sensibility and I didn't know its context at first. So I asked her and she says that in trying to form this language, she's trying to get to the essence of architecture and that the closest she got was when Shahidal was in jail um, in terms of the spaces that she was seeing and feeling in her mind. 
And even though those very strong visions and sensations have receded, sorry, did I say he was in prison for 107 days and he's now released um, very, very gladly. Um, but, but she's trying to connect back, you know, that her whole work now is a striving to, 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 to reach that, that place again, those spaces that she was seeing. And she's made this illusion um, with Beckett uh, his short ping is a short story by Samuel Beckett and the way in which he breaks and reshapes language in order to give clues to, to this, this way in which she was envisioning the spaces that she saw or tried to see when Shahidal was absent, that incommensurable uh, kind of absence or void. And it goes through like that at present. Um, so to conclude, I'm offering these works uh, that I, I see as being as resisting acts of extreme violence. I think they resist the various complexes of surveillance under which we live. To paraphrase Ariella Azule, perhaps a, a refuge can be found within the register of the image. I think these works in the spirit of a civil contract of photography um, generate a sense of an active image and wounded, broken and fragmented bodies are honored but further violence perhaps is not enacted. I see an ethics of gentleness in these works uh, and in the case of Barnard's work, perhaps a ludic quality and such terms, gentleness and playfulness are rarely associated with technology or surveillance or even with documentary photography. So I want to suggest that when <clears throat> genres encounter their limits, that that's maybe where we find the active image kind of squeezing out of its frame, offering perhaps the kind of extension to human vision that we do surely need. That's the end of this presentation. Um, I wanted to finish with this image from my favorite ever photo book and the idea of keeping watch. So um, I think I'm going to be joined now by uh, Pat and Caroline. Thanks so much for listening. I'm going to open the chat, which I have previously kept closed. Max, that's so beautiful. And Thank you I, so much. Yeah. I want to give you the applause that you so richly deserve um, in the absence of an actual audience, um, because I'm sure I'm not alone in just um, feeling so much gratitude for this beautifully wide ranging and powerful and resonant presentation. Um, I want to defer to Pat, if you have a question first, I have so many, I don't even know which one to choose yet. <laughs> no, I, I have, I have no questions. I have this, uh, this observation about the strange beauty that perhaps relates to your notion of the gentleness that comes forward. And uh, just a few days ago, I was looking at an image and I, I don't, I'm not sure whether it's Trevor Paglin's image or not, but it's an image from space of walls. Um, it was a discussion of the wall being built on the southern border here, but it was an image from space of there are many walls being built all around the United States. And I think it was the very snake-like wall between India and Pakistan. And it's lit apparently all night long. It's lit constantly, but at night it looks like the most beautiful river of fire. And it demarcates the sense of exile that that image you had of the almost circular uh, fire around the women who were in exile in Nepal for menstruating, and that's that that the, the peculiar way in which um, the 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 awful demarcation of exile uh, from a distance is so beautiful and entrancing and engaging in this paradoxical um, aesthetic. Yes, yes, paradoxically is right. Yes, it was um, one of the a place to begin this conversation was with Trevor Paglin, but I was, um, and his work is, is extraordinary and his engagement with, with these issues is, is profound. Um, yeah, I was, I was just determined to, to speak with women. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I don't know that image to which you refer, but I shall be looking it up. Yeah, I, I, and I'm, I think it was, let me put it this way, I think it's Trevor Paglin, but it, but it was some of his space looking down on earthwork. <laughs> yeah. I'm furiously Googling and I'm not able to find it at this moment, but um, I, the, the, the point that you make, Pat, about the simultaneous and paradoxical beauty of these images that nevertheless signify extreme violence, colonialism, and um, surveillance ultimately makes me think about, so I, I do have this 
question about, because you've given us such this uh, rich archive of, of art uh, to interrogate. And my question is really about um, the politics of audience and um, the artist intent when they have a political kind of a goal, and this would speak specifically to Basu's um, imagery um, of, of women who are criminalized for menstruating and exiled for menstruating. And so I guess my question, because you've given us this range, some of the images contain the actual female bodies who are under scrutiny or who are at the center of this uh, effort for justice. And then others are, uh, provide abstractions or provide um, surrogate bodies. And I wonder if you can just talk to us a little bit about how you decode um, these kinds of political uh, valences um, from the perspective of uh, the, um, the artist's intent um, in terms of what kind of transformative justice they are trying to bring through their work. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's actually the precise question that came up when um, with Visible Justice, we curated, um, well, it, it, we didn't start with the curation, we started with um, some relationships. And so we paired our body of media school LCC postgrad students with a variety of organisations and artists. So Reprieve was one of them. Um, there was an environmental NGO um, involved, so human rights NGO and environment plan B was the environmental NGO. And then with some um, specific artists, for example, Polomi Basu was one and Larry Achiampong and David Blandy was another. We also work with Refugee Journalism, which is an LCC organization. And they worked together for a term um, and produced, I could say artworks, but I'd rather say artifacts, which I then curated into an exhibition throughout LCC. And um, oh, and also, yeah, my, my good friend Damani's um, work, uh, he, was, he is in exile from Syria uh, and he has experienced the huge amounts of and unending amounts of, of broken bodies. Um, and his entire concern about exhibiting his own imagery from the war was, was not to further enact violence upon them. And so there was this moment when I realized that the whole and this is going to sound shocking and horrible, but this was sort of what hit me that the whole show was about was littered with dead bodies, but there were thankfully very few bodies on show and it was this 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 precise. Um, yeah, di dichotomy, this line or this, this balance be between when showing a body will enact further violence. And that's the way in which I have wanted to think about it ever since. Um, just that precisely that desire, I do not want to enact any more violence. So um, with, with Polymy's imagery, even though, I mean, that's it's not representative, that's a promo video for it but the the way in which she uses vr and i have to i'm just going to say i'm not actually a vr fan um the only time that i've felt anything bodily from it was actually with polymy's work it normally just makes me feel a bit dizzy and a bit annoyed um but but she did bring this this sense of, of isolation that can sometimes feel like this distant strangeness that, that i i alluded to um and just thinking through and what we did with um Dubani's work the syrian artist was um we we put some silk coverings over the, the most brutal images with this idea that, um, and it was the same, it was actually satin fabric that was used to shroud the dead bodies in um, Duma, his hometown, when the city had run out of the fabric that was normally used to shroud the bodies. So th th it, they, they had this very strange experience where the, the citizens were shrouding their dead in these brightly colored satins. And so we used these, similar satins they're actually from you know a london market but um to to cover over damani's um photojournalistic images that's what they were they were they were evidence damani's images are evidence of of atrocities in syria um and yeah and this became the question and so you know images on their own um even with good good wall text so for me that with every respect to um artists intended but the way we work in visible justice, we would always have a symposium. We would always bring in a variety of practitioners, not only the artists, to, to talk about the work. And for me, that's the way in which art becomes active. Um, it, otherwise, only people who like art see art. 
Um, and so with the variety of practitioners, and so not just the people who had made the work, but um, Khalid Abdullah, who's a, um, a filmmaker from, um, from Egypt, um, came and, and talked about, yeah, his, 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 he made a very bodily kind of contribution to, to proceedings. But I think if, if that answers your question, just the, with, with an ethical intention to, to, to do no more violence, it, it does get to the heart of the question that you posed with uh, around Joy Bulamwini's um, question of what to show, uh, what do you really want uh, Joy, Joy Bulamwini's work uh, taking issue with the degree to which AI misidentifies dark skin. And uh, do we really want to be seen is the heart of the um, this shrouding, but also your use of you, you, you chose images with so much shadow in them, or the uses of shadow, and uh, were, were intriguing to me. And uh, it reminded me a little bit of of Alfredo Jarre's work when he um, was a photojournalist in Rwanda, and he took pictures of the shadows rather than the images of bodies, or he took pictures of the sky above, and uh, you know the the light that was cast and. Uh, it, it, it remind. I'm, I've been reading Isabel Wilkerson's book on caste, in the, in, which focuses on the United the United States' racial system as a caste system. And one of the things she observes is that in Indian caste, the lowest caste sometimes had to drag a branch behind them to literally erase their shadows, <laughs> their shadows of being. And the question of shadowing and shrouding as a um, as not just a form of mourning, but of um, of erasure is one thing, but the way in which you erased or AI sometimes erases and creates shadows of of of, of who we are um, really vexes the question with which you began about whether or not these th this technology is an, is is a prosthetic, or whether or not we what we're looking at are the um, um, are the the, 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 the it, we are replaced by human robotic performances of ourselves and uh but but, but I, I wonder the, the the layered symbolism of of uh the literal veils that you're talking about but the the kind of um uh, algorithmic bodies through which we are now <laughs> uh seen that displace our, our very being is is quite an interesting um question in all of your photos like the erasure of the flags for example um mm -hmm. the, the blank spaces um uh, um. Yeah, I mean, in in terms of um, kind of almost like the the politics of the shadow, even though I didn't um, include it in my spoken presentation, I always just want to include it in every presentation. But one of the reasons that I fell in love with the image text that is the Sweet Fly Paper of Life by Roy Di Carava and Langston Hughes is because Di Carava shoots in the shadows because that's the life that the people in Harlem had. They lived in the shadows. They lived in the shadows because the buildings were tall, because the sun didn't get there. And if you shoot um, you know, dark, dark skin with the, the photographic film that was available, then people look very dark because film is, is racist, you know, hence the, the Shirley cards, etc. And it was extraordinary to me to see um, the, this book where, you know, a, a, a photographer might pick it up and say, you know, well, th this needs to be made lighter or something like that. And the kind of the, the politics of, of De Carava's um, keeping the shadow in has I mean, that's one of the earliest works I was asked at the real very beginning of my relationship with photography. I was only I'd only just started teaching at Westminster and I was asked for some reason to do a talk at um, to share a panel um, at LSE on sort of um, photography and poverty. Um, and I couldn't quite bear the idea of sort of looking at, at sad images of people, which I felt like was what I was expected to do of, you know, starving people. Um, and I actually ended up talking about that book because with the, it's, you know, the way in which it shoots in, in the shadows, because that's mm -hmm. what life was like. And the, the privations that are touched upon, like um, the, the woman who's the, the main protagonist in, in the story, getting changed into her best clothes before she goes home after work because her work has been like a cleaning job of some kind. Um, and so she doesn't want to enter her home being being looking grubby. She wants to enter her home looking beautiful and proud. And it doesn't, I'm not quoting, that's not a quote, um, but that's the, the sensation I got from it. Um, 
but yes, yeah, so I've I think I think about shadows in a different way. And perhaps this is a good thing from photographers. I think of it only in a kind of conceptual way. And it has an extremely interesting link and kind of yeah, metaphorical play with the idea of the shroud that, that you raise. And yeah, I'd actually love to sort of do some work just only on that. So I have, we, we're running out of time, but we do have this one question that I want to share with you and see if we have time to get at it. Um, it is from someone who studies English and computer science. And one of the things that has been most disturbing to me about modern surveillance is the way in which innocuous images, such as photos that a parent might post of their child on Facebook, become contributions to surveillance as data made up of faces and people and how it's sold and repurposed. Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on both this decidedly modern phenomenon and the way intentionality or unintentionality is important to our conceptions of visual justice. That's from Cindy Zhang. Thank you so much, Cindy. That's a great question. Is it in the chat box? I feel like I'd like to read it. Um, I it don't. It is. It's in the Q and A. Ah, hang on. Ah, thank you so much for that, Cindy. Um, so, sorry, loses glasses. <laughs> I'll just sit back a bit. Um, yeah, I wonder. Visual justice is one thing, but visible justice. And I think this, this intention of what we are sharing and what might it might be used for. I mean, yeah, half the people I know don't, don't post pictures of their young children's faces, but then there's a whole generation that's just gone where every every single moment was posted. I feel like there's there's a change um, in yeah, sort of teenagers and what what they share now, but but not, I mean, that's just much too general to to say anything useful um, about it. Um, I think I suppose what I wanted to, to get back to is, you know, really what is visible justice? Is it always about making visible? And I think that perhaps the, the holding back and the, the, the keeping in can, can sometimes be a, a better route to, to a kind of, of justice and, and one that we could, we could share. I, I don't know if that quite answers the question, but thank you for it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Max. Um, I, uh, I so much appreciate um, your time and this incredibly powerful intervention. You've given us uh, so much to consider in terms of visible and visual justice and that tension that you just very eloquently highlighted in response to uh, Cindy's question. Um, and so in addition to thanking Max Houghton for spending this time with us today, I wanna thank all of you who have accompanied us in this vital and, and fascinating conversation. And I wanna invite everyone to keep an eye out on the Composite Bodies website for updates on our spring events, which we will post there shortly. Um, and until then, thank you again to Max Houghton for this amazing presentation and a good afternoon to everyone.